For a while this morning, I would like for us to, concerning the, concerning the teaching of the Bible, examine the concerning of the teaching of the Bible as to repentance and confession of sin. Repentance and confession of sin. Yeah, that's about as fundamental as it gets. Everything that we deal with concerning our salvation, the forgiveness of our sins, and God does the forgiving. Everything comes down to the matter of, of repentance. It's not the only thing. We're not saying that at all. In fact, I don't know of any one single solitary thing that saves anybody. The blood of Christ saves, the Bible says. Faith saves, the Bible says. Confession is made into salvation, the Bible says. And baptism saves us too. But it takes all of those in their proper place. And you will see, I hope, in a moment, if you don't already know, and for those who do, then I hope it's refreshing to you, why we're talking about biblical repentance and confession of sin. We have to ask, first of all, the question, what is the importance of confession of our sins? Keeping in mind that we are confessing that we have violated God's law. That we have transgressed the law of God, 1 John 3, 4. Uh, we may have omitted something God obligated us to do in order to be saved or to be faithful to God. All of it means we've missed the mark. And thus, Romans 3, 23, as far as people in need of Christ and His gospel, the power of God to save us, Romans 1, 16, says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. So we know then that repentance and confession of sins has a great bearing upon our, number one, becoming a Christian and then living faithful to our Lord in the church. We find James saying to Christians in James 5, verse 16, Confess your faults one to another. And pray one for another, that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. If you look at the writings of the Apostle John, keeping in mind that they address themselves to members of the church here, in 1 John chapter 5, beginning in verse 15, And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask. We know that we have the petitions that we desire of Him. Think of how that ties into James 5.16. But now watch this. Instruction from God. This is obligatory. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death. And unto means in order to death. Remembering death is separation. He's talking about spiritual separation. If any man... See his brother sin a sin which is not unto death. Separation from God. He shall ask. And he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. So it's rather obvious that this business of Forgiveness of sins important and important to those in the church. Now we've just seen from James 5.16 that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And we've seen that we're to confess our faults one to another. We see that there's something for which we should not pray. And it's called the sin unto death and a brother can commit it. And the order from heaven is don't pray for him for the forgiveness of sins. I didn't come up with that any more than I did baptism for the remission of sins. That's just it binding on us as is anything else that's obligatory in the Bible. God said, do not pray for a brother who commits the sin unto death. What is it? Not that difficult. We know that every sin can be forgiven of God. Well, how is it that you can commit a sin that's unto death and the faithful brethren shouldn't even pray for you. Well now, think for a minute, brethren. 
Sin's a transgression of the law. That separates you from God. And yet our subject today is confession of sin and repentance. There's nothing anywhere in the Bible, all other things being scripturally equal, that says that a person cannot repent of any sin that one commits because Christ will forgive all sins. Now put the two together. If there's a sin unto the absolute separation of you from God and God says through the Apostle John and part of the New Testament of His Son, and His Son came to forgive sins. Don't you faithful brethren pray for it. And yet the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And John goes over and over again saying, He answers our prayers. He answers our petitions. Then why are we prohibited from praying for a person who's committed a sin that has separated him from God. I thought all sin separated you from God. The only sin God will not forgive. For which we are forbidden to pray. Is the sin. That a brother will not repent of. Will God forgive him? When he won't repent? There's not a thing in the Bible that says he will. And John is plainly saying to every faithful child of God that if a brother will not repent of his sins, he is permanently separated from God. And it does no good to ask God to forgive him when that person will not comply with what God has stipulated in his word to get forgiveness. Would we pray for the forgiveness of a person's sin who is an atheist? Would we pray for a person's sin who believed in God but didn't believe in Christ? Would we pray God to forgive a person who believed in God and believed in Christ but didn't believe the gospel of Christ or the plan of salvation? Would we pray that God would receive as a child of God fully forgiven of his sins a person who would not be baptized for in order to unto in order to the remission of sin? Do you? What about a brother who's obeyed the gospel, but then, by sinning, is separated from God? When should I pray for him? What should I pray for him? I can't pray that he'd be forgiven of his sins until he repents of them and confesses those sins. And the Bible has a great deal to say about confessing sins as the evidence that you have repented. Therefore, when people come forward and they should if they are in sin as children of God, and they confess their sins, they confess their faults, as the Scripture also refers to sins, then that is, if it's done scripturally, saying, I have repented of my sins. So then that raises the question, what is repentance? Because confession of one's sin is evidence of repentance. That's the way the Bible treats it. So that we are to pray for the person who commits sin, but evidence is repentance when they confess that sin. But the person who commits sin will not confess the sin, we're prohibited from paying for it. Because the person is not evidence repentance. It's not that difficult if we'll just think with what the Bible teaches us. First John 5, 15 through 17 then has to do with a sin a brother won't repent of and thus will not evidence that repentance by confessing that sin. I am prohibited from praying that that person's sins be forgiven. And to pray anyway is presumptuous on my part. For I have no authority from God to do it. He won't forgive him. And neither should I. If I do, I'm doing contrary to the Lord of my, the will of my Savior. Now, sometimes a word in the Bible like repentance really doesn't give us a real clear concept of its meaning. Because too many people probably think of repentance as, well, I'm really sorry about that. They've had some sort of emotional tug at the heart and they're really sorry about what they've done or not done. But that doesn't necessarily mean they repented. You know, we don't use this word repentance much in our daily conversation. 
You just think about it for a minute and see if you use it very much. And we're also acutely aware that the modern meaning of a word may not convey the meaning of the original in the Bible. And that we must take into consideration. But repentance is a word that's essential to our salvation. And it must be understood and put into practice in our lives as needed. Now I want you to look at something here in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verses 9 and 10. Written to the church. Based upon what he told them that they should do regarding their sins in the first epistle. Remember, there was, uh, among other sins in that church, there was a man who had his father's wife, and the Scripture says the church was all puffed up about it. They weren't mourning the fact that they had a brother in their midst that had committed that sin, and Paul goes ahead to say, why, even among the Gentiles, that sin's not mentioned. And they were living in a city that was known for licentiousness, lasciviousness, throughout the whole of the Roman Empire. In fact, to call a person... Uh, that you've been, or say to a person you've been Corinthianized was really a slur even in that bygone day of wicked things. So here's the church called out of the world by the gospel. If they're really convicted of sin and converted, they're different from those who live on the level of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes of pride of life. But in this case, they're not. And Paul rebukes them severely about what they ought to do with that person in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. But now we come to the second letter. Things have happened in the church of Corinth based upon the first letter that we now are able to see in the second letter. And he's talking about what that first letter did to those people. It made them sorry for their sins. And he says in verse 8, For though I made you sorry with the letter, I do not repent. That is, I'm not sorry. I do, I do not repent of having written the letter that made you see yourself as God sees you. To cause you to see what needed to be done in your life. He says, Though I did repent, for I perceive the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were for a season. In other words, I'm sorry I have to do it. It had to be done, and I'm sorry for it. Because I love your soul enough to say to you what you need to hear when you don't want to hear it. And that's exactly what he's saying. But then we learn something here about repentance. Notice further in verse 9. Now I rejoice. Not that, I, that you're made sorry. I hate I had to do this. We say things like that. But that ye sorrow too. Repentance. For ye were made sorry. After a godly manner. We're going to come back to that in a minute. That you might receive damage by us nothing. For godly sorrow works repentance to salvation not to be repented of. But the sorrow of this world works death. And that's where most of the sorrow is in this world as far as anybody being sorry. It's more like, well, I got caught. Next time I have to do better. Or, well, I've smoothed it over and got them off my back this time. Then I'll go ahead when this all settles down and do whatever it is I want to do in the first place. That stuff goes on all the time and more like it. And it's just of this world. But he's not dealing with a sorrow of this world. He's not dealing with repentance as men may define it or is it thought of nowadays. He's setting out the will of heaven because God put us together. He knows how we work. He knows how to approach us. He knows how to get us to do what we need to do if it can be done with us at all. And then that goes back to the will as to whether it can be done with us at all. So I want to pursue this. You notice then that Paul associates with this repentance with salvation. So if you don't engage in this, sal this repentance, you're not going to receive the salvation. It's that serious. You remember in Jesus' teaching in Luke 13, verses 3 and 5, that he tells us, that the lack of biblical repentance brings destruction, eternal damnation. A person ought to always, as a member of the church, have a disposition of mind, an attitude, a mindset that is ever ready to receive the will of God and correct himself with it. That means then one must be ready always to repent when they see what they need to turn from and then to turn to. Repentance and the word repent are used in passages that we might call pivotal passages on this subject. Luke 24, 
46 through 47, that's Luke's account of the Great Commission. We don't quote it that often. We usually quote Matthew or we usually quote Mark. But rarely do we quote Luke's account. And look where he gives the emphasis. And yet it takes all these scriptures together to get the full import and the full meaning of what the Lord put into what should be preached and the importance of the Great Commission. In Luke chapter 24, notice verse 46. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, And thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Now listen. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name by his authority among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Then he says to the apostles, New witnesses of these things. All you have to do is turn over to Acts chapter 2 in the first recorded gospel sermon with Peter standing up with the other apostles and setting out by the power of the Holy Spirit and the guidance of the Holy Spirit the facts that prove that Christ is the Son of God and the things necessary to convict those people who were devout religious people of their sins. And when they were by the evidence caused to believe in Christ, for faith comes by hearing the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. It says they were pricked in their hearts, the inward man. Their conscience said, you are in a mess and it's your fault and you can't do anything about it. No other man can do anything about it. And if you die right now, you are lost. And thus, they cried out unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And as believers, the first thing out of his mouth was, Repent. And then be baptized. For and to in order to, what end? The remission of forgiveness of your sins. I said in the beginning, no one thing saves us. And you can already see they had to believe. They had to repent. And they had to be baptized to obtain the remission or forgiveness of sins. That is, where God in His mind would say, I hold your sins and your iniquities against you no more. They're blotted out as if they had never taken place. And they were saved and added to the church by the Lord Himself because their sins were forgiven. So you see that in the Great Commission that repentance is emphasized by Luke. And what he said there is exactly what was preached by Peter. And then there's a, another interesting thing that helps us understand better what biblical repentance is. In Matthew chapter 21 and verse 29, but we'll back up to verse 28. Jesus says, um, But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, Go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he repented and went. And he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. And he went not. Then the Lord put a question to them. Whither of them two did the will of his father? They said to him, The first. Jesus said to them, Verily I say unto you that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. You know why? Because the publicans and harlots will hear the gospel and meet its demands in order to obtain remission of sins, and those stuck-up Jews wouldn't. They just simply said, We're going to heaven on the basis of the fact that we're Abraham's seed. Don't tell me I'm a sinner. It won't do you any good. Something called humility was lacking in those people who were so religious and so devout. So religious and so devout, they wouldn't hear the words of our Lord. The very Lord they claimed to be representing Him on this earth and the only ones that represent Him on this earth. And Jesus said, such people as that will go into the kingdom before you do. And it only comes down to the fact that they would repent of their sins like the first young man in the account the Lord gave. So we can see some things here that needs to be in our minds regarding when we sin as children of God and what to do about it. If you think repentance then is the feeling of 
sorrow, you have really misunderstood what the Bible teaches about it. If you think that repentance is the reformed life that people live after they have repented, a life that is now in submission to God's will, you still don't have it right. And so I want to us for us to determine from the right divided word what repentance what the repentance of one says entails in us so we can understand its connection to the confession of our sins and how that we really are ready to confess our sins. For confession of sin doesn't amount to a hill of beans if you haven't repented. Because confession of sin means you have repented as it's looked at in the Bible. We've already seen it doesn't mean saying, Well, I'm sorry. And then go about your merry way. You're going to see, and I make so bold to say this now, the biblical repentance means a radical change in your life. In whatever sin you're engaged in that you realize. It means really, I will not commit that sin anymore. I will no longer have the attitude that put me into taking, uh, breaking God's law. So I want us to understand that. And then we can ask the question honestly before God in the light of the Bible, Have I truly repented? I just said, I'm sorry. I got caught. They put pressure on me. I'll just smooth it over. It'll all pass away. Well, that's the truth most men. You know, you know, the devil said to God about Job what was not true about Job, but was true of most people. Skin for skin. All a man hath, he'll give for his life. That's true of most people. You put the old gun upside the head with several bodies already laying there, that the fellow's already shot, and he's saying, now, you deny that Christ is the Son of God, and you curse him right now, I'm going to blow your brains out. And you've already watched him do that to several people. Now what are you going to do? Well, oh, I'd, I'd go right on through it. You sure? Peter made that boast once and made a mess out of that. It's one thing to know exactly what you ought to do and try to live your life so you'll be strong enough to do it. But when the chips are down, sometimes it always comes at us in a way that we're really not quite prepared for. So let's resolve to do what's right and work toward that end, but not be so bold as to think, well, I'm just, I, nothing can bring me low. That's usually when you're brought low. <laughs> if you look in uh, Matthew 12, 41, you'll find the Lord referred back to the preaching of Jonah to the Ninevites in Jonah 1, 1 and 2, and in chapter 3 of that book. He had a reason for that. He simply said to the Ninevites that the preaching that Jonah did back in those days had been... Uh, or the preaching I've done here to you, the same kind of preaching Jonah had back in those days, uh, you should have repented. But they didn't. And what he was pointing out was, a greater than Jonah is here, and you won't listen to me. You can't get any greater than the Son of God in the flesh preaching to you what you need to hear. They wouldn't repent. But the people in Nineveh did. And that was Jonah, and he was sort of a begrudging preacher. Look what it took to get him to preach. Sounds a whole lot like my... You know, we might more compare to Jonah about anybody else in the Bible when it comes to being concerned about the plan of salvation. We saw, I had a person ask me, do you really think he thought he could run away from God? I wanted to say, but the person I knew was sincere. I wanted to say, yeah, my brethren do it every day all day long. And you know how you run away from God? That's God's word that applies to me. Yep. But you don't do it. If that's not running away from God, you tell me what it is. They heard the preaching of Jonah. They were challenged with the truth he preached regarding their sinful lives. They came by that truth to understand that the God of heaven condemned their lives because they were sinners. And according to Jonah chapter 3 and verse 5, notice again, they believed God through Jonah's preaching. And their life changed. It didn't change without they were willing to do it. And they're not even Jews. But they had sinned under the law God had for them, and Jonah, who approached God under the law of Moses, was sent to preach to them. So much in that that we won't get into now, because we're emphasizing one thing. They repented at the preaching of Jonah, and people will not repent at the preaching of Christ. They went from pride and haughtiness and arrogance to humility. Sackcloth demonstrated their repentance. They went from satisfaction and happiness with themselves that God ought to be happy that whatever their gods were, whatever they thought about it, to a state of self-denial evidenced by their fasting. 
They went from idolatry, no doubt, to true worship, chapter 3 and verse 8. They went from all manner of evil to righteous living, chapter 3 and verse 8. The false, that would have meant in repentance that the false gods were put away. It would mean to bring it down to the way things are nowadays that the light life and all that characterizes that was shut down. That all things that make a person drunk as we think of today and all the carousing that went on stopped. Peace and calm then enveloped the city even as it would today if people would listen to the truth of the gospel of what the Bible teaches about how we should live. But they don't and it doesn't. Now you'll notice that in none of the points we've just made can you find repentance in just so many words or actually the word itself or any form of it uh, given or stated. What we see really are the results of people having repented. And our text over in 2 Corinthians 7, 9 through 10 tells us that repentance and uh, that repentance is not literally godly sorrow that godly sorrow whatever it is works repentance and that following repentance there's a complete change of one's life it's the fruits that one sees that proves repentance that's why confession of sin is what the bible says is the evidence that you have repented it's what we see and we hear and we understand You see in Matthew 21, 28 through 30 that repentance is the difference between I will not and I will. I used to demonstrate this. And I'm too lazy right now to do it, to walk down this aisle. And as I go down that aisle, I say, I'm going to hell. I will go to hell. I will go to hell. And then stopping about halfway down it, doing an about face. I said, I'm not going to go to hell. I will to go to heaven and walk back this way. That may be very simple, but it affects something about it. The Ninevites, having heard the message of Jonah and believing God's message, changed their minds and then they changed their lives. So the, really the change of mind itself is the result of actual repentance. It's just so closely connected you, you can hardly explain the difference. It's sort of like the plan of salvation of hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, being baptized. We do that simply to show the steps, but they can take place pretty fast in a person's mind. In the case of the prodigal son, another example of repentance, Luke 15, 10 through 24, we see in the context, verse 10, that the subject really is repentance. He remembered from whence he had fallen. He had been taught. He knew what was right. He left it and went down, 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 verse 17. But then he had a resolve of the heart. He remembered the truth. He understood what he had left, and he made a determination. Verse 18, I will arise and he brought it to action verse 20 he began his journey he confessed his sins now where did the repentance come in well it's not necessarily when he came to himself remembering as he should have never forgot what he was taught and how he was brought up at home it wasn't even when he started for home it wasn't even when he confessed to his father how unworthy he was and didn't need to have, didn't expect anything to come back as it used to be. It was prior to his determination to make a change. Verse 18 said, I will. Once again, there is a point. Somewhere after godly sorrow, 2 Corinthians 7, 9, the only thing that can work repentance in anybody, sorrow toward God for their sins against Him, and only sorrow toward God for their sins against Him. For all sin ultimately is against God. I don't care if it involves you or anybody else. Ultimately, all sin is against God. And He's the one who must forgive you. So there's a point after godly sorrow. And before the fruit of repentance or good works, Matthew 3, 8, where we find exactly repentance. Now since the day of of Pentecost, God has proclaimed through the gospel that all men everywhere must repent as a part of the gospel message. Something we must do. Acts 2.38 we've read, there's Peter's pronouncement. 
Then Paul said the same thing to those uh, people on Mars Hill who didn't even know the God of the Bible, Acts 17.30. And says it's a command to all men everywhere. They must repent. It's obligatory. You will not gain remission of sins without it. So repentance is necessary as an erring child of God, but also necessary to become a child of God. And you must ask yourself honestly if you've truly repented. And that's gravely important. Because if you hadn't make any difference what else you do after that, you're still in your sin. Or as a child of God, if you sin and you do not truly biblically repent, you can confess all day long and you're still in your sins. Did possibly somebody make a show of obeying the gospel? Peer pressure, emotionalism, to please parents, to get that girl, to whatever. Well, you know, and God knows. Now, if you know, and God knows, and you know it's contrary to the Bible, then you know God knows it's contrary to the Bible. Now, what are you going to do? Just say, well, I'll just go before the judgment knowing I did something that people think is one thing, and yet I know it's something else, and I'll just slip it right by God. I hope you change before you get there. Was there a moment in time when you determined that you were going to do things God's way no matter what? Now you're on the right track. You know, even members of the church, indeed I, say, I guess I should say, especially members of the Lord's church who are guilty of sin, sometimes and all the time that they're guilty of sin, need to repent. We find ourselves in sin. You know, the great gospel plan of salvation and the scheme of redemption makes provision for the child of God sinning. What would it be if we could obey the gospel and our alien sins remitted and we get in the church? Don't you dare sin again. There is no hope whatsoever. Now the attitude of the faithful child of God, I don't want to sin. I'm not going to sin. I'm going to do all I can to stay away from sin and so on. But from time to time, John says you do sin. And then he says, but we have an advocate with the Father. We have one who will mediate for us as a child of God in the family of God. Our elder brother and only mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ. And thus, if we confess our sins, he is just and faithful to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, John says. But that confession is based upon full and complete repentance. Completely. So, bringing it all down to the end, what is repentance? Godly sorrow, I say again, sorrow toward God for your sins, the transgression of God's law, your sins against Him, is the only thing that can work repentance in a person. And if you cannot be brought to a state of sorrow toward God for your sins against Him, you will never repent. So I need to ask the question, how is godly sorrow created in me? And you should be asking that question in you. Godly sorrow is developed in a person by the gospel of Christ. Let's be more specific. That part of the gospel that makes one realize the eternal consequences that one will suffer forever in hell if they don't get right with God, if they don't believe the truth, if from the heart they don't do what God requires of them. That's one way the gospel gets people to be brought to godly sorrow, which sorrow is the only thing that could bring you to repentance. And the other thing is the very goodness of God. Romans chapter 2, Paul makes that clear. Listen to this, Romans 2 and verse 4. He asked those brethren there in Rome, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? When, when I think of the love of God, when I think of what Christ came up, just to be, gave up just to become a man of the glory and majesty of heaven, to put himself into a position like I'm in to save my soul, it's too much for me. What makes my soul worth that much that the very second person of the Godhead will become a man and come down here to this earth and put himself through all that he did now, when you consider what God's going to do to people who choose to die in rebellion to His Son and the place prepared for them, and when you consider all the love of God and what He's done for us to save us, we could never do for ourselves. If both or one or the other of those things will not move a person to be 
heart just break down before God for our sins against Him. There's nothing else in the gospel system that's going to do it. And without godly sorrow, which works repentance, you cannot repent. You cannot. It's an impossibility. The mechanism is not there to bring it about. Repentance then, listen to me, is the humbling and the breaking down and complete collapse of the stubborn will of man, which is the seat of all sin and rebellion against God. This collapse of one's will leads to a complete change of mind and perspective of life and mindset. And it is seen in the repentant person's obedience to the truth. And thus, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why confession of sins, as I said in the beginning? It's the evidence that we have ceased to trust in self. That self, not guided by the will of heaven, has got us in the mess we're in and we can't get ourselves out. Unaided, we're lost. And the cry should fall from our lips, as it did for Peter when he asked to come to the Lord walking on the water, but took his eyes off the Savior and began to sink. Lord, save me. When a person really repents, you don't have any problem seeing it. It won't be coming down to the front saying, if I've offended somebody, oh no. You will be a broken person. So what passes sometimes as repentance? It better be reexamined to understand that one of the things a child of God must understand to be faithful to God. Folks, we can be pretty proud folks. We can pretty well work things out to gloss things over. When what we need is to fall prostrate in our inner man before the Son of the living God with a cry upon our lips as registered in our heart, have mercy on me, O Lord. Cleanse me from my sins. Make me whiter than snow. I have sinned. Only I have sinned against Thee. I am lost and deserve eternal damnation. And I cry as I know not how else to cry, but into the source of all majesty and love. Please forgive me of my sin. If you'll just read the 51st Psalm and think about the words, you'll see a broken and contrite spirit is what real repentance is. No effort at all to say, well, now, Lord, you've got to understand my position. None of that. It's just I have sinned and sinned against you and only against you. And I must partake of thy mercy. I don't deserve it. I need mercy. I can't save myself. So I hope you understand better now the biblical teaching of God on repentance and its, con its connection for members of the church with their confession of their sins. Confess your faults one to another. And pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We've studied what to do to become a Christian. We've studied what a person who's a child of God needs to do if they've committed sin. If it's a private sin known only to you and God, repent of it and confess it there as we've studied. But if your sin has brought reproach upon the blood-bought body of Christ, you need to come and make it as as clear in confessing the sin as you possibly can as it was committed publicly. The invitation of our blessed Lord is still to you and now while we stand and sing.